ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dying Time is here. That's right, we are finishing up A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, on Kill by Kill. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from 1428 Elm Street. This is the Kill by Kill podcast, where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, and that is the characters. We're going to unpack all the gory details of Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, in the hopes that a still uh, a living ex-student of Springwood High... <laughs> <laughs> Their death is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make about them. And as always, there's only one person I trust that if I tell her I need you to go open up the crypt of this dead nun, she's going to do it. The one and only Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing, Gina? I'm great. We we got out of that, that elevator that we were stuck in when we had to do the... Uh... Had to do the clip show last time. Yes. You 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 gave birth to a healthy, beautiful baby that you named after me. It's just everything mm-hmm. everything is wonderful. <laughs> it really you, you really named is. you named the baby Gina Fuck Horse Hamilton. <laughs> it is the perfect product of the two of us. <laughs> uh, it has a tongue that you like to finger. Um, <laughs> I like to ride it at night. <laughs> Uh, you know, typical things that you want to do with a fuck horse. It will make your dad kind of want to seduce you. <laughs> or at least be really okay with your soul kiss. This is a lot of Prom Night 2 content. You can tell how much we're really enjoying Nightmare on Elm Street 5, oh, The Dream yeah. Child. It's a, it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece <laughs> that I sat there looking at with a face like I just sucked a lemon. <laughs> Well, I hate to alarm everyone, we're not alone. Uh, You know him from his work uh, as read on Dread Central, Bloody Disgusting, and Diabolique. His upcoming book is entitled The Complete History of Puppet Master. It's the one, the only, Nat Bremer. How are you doing, Nat? I am doing great. Thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. Thank you for being here. You are a man who is learned about horror history, and you love to tuck into the nooks and crannies and weirdness of horror's past. So I'm really yeah. excited about all the things you have learned about this weirdo movie. <laughs> I have learned so many things about this weirdo <laughs> movie. Some Excellent. of them in the past 24 hours. Oh, no. There's <laughs> updates. Oh, buckle up, everybody. Uh, before we get into it, however, uh, we have a small tradition here on the Kill by Kill podcast. We always like to ask our guests what their first experience was with the Nightmare on Elm Street series. What was it for you, pray tell? I guess the short version is that I was kind of introduced to horror through the Universal Monsters, and I'd watch just about anything with classic monsters in them. Sure. I got really into Dracula and Frankenstein in, like, first grade. And I met a friend in like first grade who I, you know, was gushing about like, I know about monsters. I was like talking about Dracula and Frankenstein. And he just said, well, what about Jason and Freddy Krueger? Mm-hmm. I was like, who the hell are, are they? <laughs> and it opened up this totally new world of like modern horror to me at a very young age. And so mm-hmm. I learned about Jason and Freddy on the same day. And I went through this whole ordeal of like watching through every Friday the 13th movie and weirdly I didn't quite do the same thing for Nightmare on Elm Street I watched the Nightmare on Elm Street movies that I found Uh so like I obsessed over one two three and new nightmare as a kid because those were the ones I managed to get my hands on and see you know there are worse ways to go to be honest with you if you left it at that you might be okay (laughs) for some reason it never even occurred to me to like seek out four five and six even though like i could rent them i was probably 14 by the time i saw this gem of a movie for the first time <laughs> and uh i i love these franchises i love these characters and these monsters and the, the worlds uh that they inhabit of the nightmare on elm street franchise i can pretty confidently say that this is the only one that i don't love to some degree it's close to being something that you could like but there is constantly a cavalcade of problems with it. Maybe because the premise is undercooked. Maybe because it's under-executed. 
baby, because the character's great, great, great at you. I'm not sure. I'm. We're trying to diagnose it, but there's many ways in which Dream Child goes wrong and very few ways in which it goes right. One of them, before we launch into this section of the movie, is something that you had discovered in in the one of the original scripts, the way in which the characters were meant to be introduced. Thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> you thank me now. Our audience may not thank you after you tell them what the, the original intention. I desperately want to talk about my favorite hip hop group of the late 1980s, YAG. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which was our way to introduce the three heroines of our movie. Uh Uh-huh. And I want to make this clear because there were nine very different drafts of this script. And like, oh, you, a lot of wacky things may have been thought up in the script. This was the shooting script. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) And I'm actually fairly certain I've seen maybe a grainy VHS still that is proof that this may have actually been shot. Oh, no. But anyway. This is my holy grail. Okay, please continue. (laughs) I'm just going to share that these, I cannot stress this enough, are the first lines um, that these characters say. This is uh, is just a a bit from the script. Okay. Uh, Yvonne and Greta, Mm -hmm. their arms around one another, and uh, I've got a Bridget here, they Makes shrill noises of girlish delight. Uh-huh. Yvonne breaks into the girl's rap. I'm the Y, the V, O, N, N, E, and wherever I am, that's the place to be. All sure. three. Yvonne! <laughs> <laughs> Alice isn't getting into the spirit of things. Yvonne tries to interject a little enthusiasm. Come on, honey. Alice joins in, trying to be cheerful. I'm the A, L, I C E, blonde hair on my face, blue eyes to see. All three. On her face? <laughs> is she some sort of wolf lady? Is is this a, your, your sister is a werewolf situation happening in the middle of this? Oh my God, please continue. <laughs> All three. Greta, the G-R-E-T-A, and my mom says I'll be in magazines one day. Oh, now she's celebrating this. Perfect. We're Great. three together, and three will be the Y- the A, and don't forget the G. Yag. Yag. And that's Yag. <laughs> Yag. I remember, like, like Team Beat you know, around this era telling me that Yag was going to be the next big thing. I, I I pulled out an issue of Sassy. I'm like, whoa, what's this Yag shit? I got to get on that. <laughs> yo, yo. Hey, are you up on this Yag shit? Oh, <laughs> uh, so this... Entire movie screams, how do you do, fellow kids? It is so (laughs) out of touch. And and it does feature Freddy Krueger on a skateboard. Yes. Which I I think was like my, my, you know, the the point where I felt the sharpest pain behind my eye. (laughs) I mean, everything that, the only thing that is missing is a don't have a cow man reference. (laughs) Tis a shame that this is not the way they decided to introduce the cast of A Nightmare on Elm Street. And what a shame that the boys weren't included. Or the parents. I would love to have heard Dan's parents get in on this action. <laughs> like, just in terms of the characters, one of two really terrible things had to have happened here. Either Yvonne is going along with this, just watching her white friends try to rap. Yes. Or, uh, as may be implicitly uh, insinuated, this is something that their one black friend taught them how to do. <laughs> there's I'm gonna, I'm there's really guess, no good I, option I, I, here. I'm going to go, I'm probably going to guess the latter is probably the, the situation <laughs> we're looking at. Because we've already had a couple one black friends in, in some of the <laughs> in some of the movies we've we've gone over here. When I heard this, when Nat mentioned this to me, in our conversations previous to recording, uh, I'm fr- I thought my face was going to peel off from the sheer <laughs> heat and fire of the stupidity of this idea. It was like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I looked at it, and I instantly started melting. And I, I'm glad that uh, it still works, even when we cover this half, because... Uh... Yag, it's important to note, is a kind of Chekhov's gun moment uh, in the script. 
don't think Yag is introduced for no reason. You you better <laughs> believe that comes back in the third act. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> the miscalculation involved in this is like seeing, you know, math equations fly across your face. A beautiful mind is happening in front of me. This is insane. And the crazy thing is, is it the worst idea in the movie? Perhaps not. I oh, think I, I, there are worse. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of gave up on trying to keep up on what was happening in the movie and just sort of kept account of how many references to different, better things there were in it. <laughs> I mean, we got an AHA video. Yeah. Uh, we've got fucking Flat Stanley. <laughs> I mean, I don't actually know if I don't remember Flat Stanley was a thing when this movie came out, but it, if yeah. it was, if it wasn't, it wasn't long after this. Of course, we've got the thing which I completely forgot about, and it's also the second movie that is way worse than the thing, but also has a reference to the thing that we have covered just in the past two months. Listen, I love the thing too, as much as I love Changeo heads. Even as a comparison to Evil Dead, it is woefully under executed i just don't understand what stephen hopkins philosophy is when it comes to filming makeup effects it's just like um how can i make this look as fake as possible how can i ruin the hard work of multiple guys with mullets yeah, we, we, and we, then we he, have, he manages it we you know then we have yvonne going to someplace that looks like arkham asylum which is <laughs> Is this, is this place just sitting in the middle of the suburbs? This, like, Victorian lunatic you, you loony bin just out in the middle of nowhere they just left abandoned? The asylum, as depicted in this version, in this movie, it's like you have the picturesque small town, the little suburbia of Edward Scissorhands with the dark gothic castle on the hill, yeah. if that was in the middle of the fucking town. <laughs> I mean, right. somehow just, in it... the two years that the has transpired between Dream Warriors and the events of this film, this hospital slash institution has decayed to the point in which, I don't know, Dr. Acula works there? There's <laughs> cobwebs a, uh, and a it, full moon. It's also the size of Buckingham Palace now. <laughs> All the trees have died nearby because the vampire bats have sucked all their life force out of them. I don't understand how this is possible, even for effect. Like, you could just, you know what? People died there. Uh, you know, Freddy Krueger supposedly was, you know, born there or whatever. It, it can be spooky without suddenly, out of nowhere, becoming a gothic romance novel cover. Well, it's clearly because Dr. Neil Gordon was fired. Yes, this is this is what happens when you get rid of Craig Wasson, everyone, the lead I, I almost, character almost, of Dream Warriors. I, almost, I miss him a little bit because he, he kind of gave it a little bit of normalcy, a little bit of, you know, dullness that I could latch on to. You know, and I'm, whereas in was like, I don't know what the fuck's happening here. <laughs> the other thing is that three clearly set up a very, like, logical version of what this should be and that you have a creepy wing of the hospital that was closed down where yeah. this happened you have all the creepy weird gusts of ghostly wind and gothic what have you that's already there you know yes. that that was already set up for you you yeah, didn't now, quite have to go this far yeah now you now it's become the video for total eclipse of the heart <laughs> Yeah, all of a sudden the haunting takes place there. It's it is so overdone. Like it could just be dark and creepy. You don't need this. Was this the first pass that like someone painted it and they're like, "Well, that doesn't look right. Well, we don't have any time. Film it." With the new version of Weston Hills, it's, you know, a little different. There's a uh, also a much different Amanda Kruger than we saw the last time. Yes. Uh, gone is the old lady from the Drew Carey show. And uh, <laughs> instead, we have a much, much younger Amanda Krueger. So, oh, like, it's hot. It's hot uh, ghost nun now, as opposed yeah. to just ghost nun. 
When did she die? Like last week? Yeah. I'm not sure. There is there is some stuff here that really needs to be unpacked. So let me get this straight. Yeah, so many questions. So I... many fucking questions about the backstory here. So she, a tragedy of hospital mismanagement. She is locked in this ripped cloth covered room of a hundred maniacs. Is abused and sexually molested and raped multiple times. This drives her insane. And the hospital's like, great, let's get you in this room. Don't worry. The bricks going up over the door are for your safety. They just fall of the House of Usher to her? And again, like, when could... When would this have happened? This would have happened, what, in the 1950s? Yes! (laughs) And the the whole thing is just, like, it's very... You know, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that feels very Victorian. And, And I don't know why, because it doesn't work with the rest of the movie. Like, you've got this pale little tragic boy in his little, you know, his little gown wandering around who looks like he's dying of consumption for some reason. I, yes. I, that, that, I, that, so I have no idea, you know, why he looks like that, why he is, you know, nine, eight or nine. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, why he, he just, you know, looks like this, you know, poor little, you know, pale, you know, member of the royal family who's been, you know, bled as a treatment. But you've got this... <laughs> You know, we, we, we hid her away in a room so society would not see her shame. This would have been, like, 1950. Yeah, so they, they I, wouldn't have just sent her away to, like, another convent somewhere? No, it's it's really better to just lock her in a room, seal it up with fucking bricks, but not to the point where birds can't actively live where her <laughs> skeleton ghost is. How, how can she not get out but... Many John Woo pigeons make their life inside of this resting spot. And also, if they bricked her up, how did the how did the media know about her tragic life? Oh God, this. And also, I, I gotta say, how is what happens to her at the end, quote unquote, setting her soul free? Yeah, last time we at least went through the rigmarole of Catholicism. Now all it takes is she has to be, Yvonne... she has to be pregnant with Freddie forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like it's she like hasn't to, put up with to, enough to save Alice's baby. She her soul has to continue suffering. I don't like that. No. I don't. I don't care for that that yes. ending very much. To save the unborn ghost of <laughs> the six foot turkey kid from Jurassic Park. <laughs> That is him, isn't it? I that knew, is him, I, yes. I knew I saw that kid somewhere before. I knew it. I couldn't figure out where. That's exactly it. Oh, my God. It, and he looked kind of, uh, he looked kind of pale he, and withered ooh. in that, too. Here, I mean, why is he wearing a a, a caftan a, made of, a filthy, cof, of a coffee wearing, bag? He's wearing a filthy hospital gown for, for, for no reason. Like, he's still in her womb. How is the the whole thing if, with the kid is so stupid? I, I, you know, why couldn't they just make it so she just hears a baby crying all the time? I mean, that would that would that would work, you know? I mean, yeah, he could know, be the, the fucking her, star child. Her, why, why, why does he need to be perso- yeah, personified? He doesn't need to be a fully grown fourth grader, just just <laughs> wandering around. And I mean, we're, we'll get to it, but this little Freddy thing. I very nearly threw my my laptop out the t- out of the window. I swear to I'm God, I'm surprised I must you have, didn't. I must have psychologically blocked that out. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's his Freddy la- voice that sells it. Oh my God! <laughs> hey, you have I'm to tell learn me what from to you. do. <laughs> <It's> like, hey, <laughs> why why why'd you put apple juice in my lunchbox? I told you not to do that. <laughs> but, so what? But when, we're, so when we're going over the Amanda stuff, like, even though this is the first part of the movie, I have to shout out the best line reading in the entire film. The Please. one dream orderly who just says, it's a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> it's job well done. <laughs> you know, it's bad once it's reached 100, whatever that is. Their job is to count to make sure they're, that 100 maniacs are accounted for. And it's not even like they're at 50. They get to 98 and he's like, shut up, it's 100. What's the matter, Frank? 
<laughs> Holy shit, this movie is dumb. I mean, the my la- the last 10 minutes of it, I stopped writing notes and I just have what written down over and over and over again. For me, with this movie, the tone has always been the most egregious thing. I actually get that Freddy's Dead is a cartoon from beginning to end, and okay, that's what that movie is. Yeah. This is a movie that every scene without Freddy in it is trying to be a serious, dark, hallmark drama about <laughs> teenage pregnancy. Yes. And it's, a then little, have... it's, a, it's a little weirdly pro-lifey, too. Which, which... Oh my god. This yeah. In the Never Sleep Again documentary, they literally refer to this proudly as the pro-choice nightmare, which it is absolutely, absolutely not. This is the most pro-life movie to ever not be funded by a church. Oh my god, the kid, the kid absolutely, literally says, you know, why don't you want me? You know, what, yeah. you know, my friend tells me you don't, you don't like me. And it's like... That's the thing. If you're going to play around with this stuff, which it is trying to do, play around with it. It's not grounded. It's not emotionally based. I don't believe anyone. No one is really wrestling with the fact that Alice is pregnant. She doesn't really wrestle with it all that much outside of general concern for the child's well-being. Well, we do, or we, the fact that it's just a gateway for a dream demon. Well, we do have that doctor who blatantly violates HIPAA laws. Oh, yes. that guy could go straight to fucking hell. <laughs> Are you telling me someone comes into your office practice and you're like, hey, let's take a look at this baby. A little large for, you know, a little large, a little large. Who on this staff understands how babies gestate? Well, that well, is, I mean, this baby is like a biscuit old. It's like and it's it, also it's also a hospital that that where it makes its candy stripers do overtime as an ultrasound technician, <laughs> which I I had to like kind of do that whole you know that gif of the the blonde hair guy kind of like blinking and like yeah <laughs> like, I was basically I was like wait is that Yvonne giving her the ultrasound? She's like 17. <laughs> you, know, I mean, you have to go to school for that. That, that and requires... A, and applying the gel with her hands, <laughs> that is not how that works. You don't have to apply it like massage oil. That is not something that requires hands-on attention. You give it a squirt and you rub the thing on top of it, for Christ's sakes. Like, oh my God, no one involved in this movie has ever been even tangentially attached to the birth of a child. It's so crazy. And then the doctor, it's like, after this, it's like uh, 1-800-someone-who's-not-a-blood-relative-of-this-child. Hi, that girl's crazy. You got to convince her to give you that unborn baby. That's not yeah. Okay. I, I gotta tell you, I've never done this with any movie we we cover on here, but I skipped right over that part because I <laughs> I have re- man, I have had enough of these shitty Elm Street adults. <laughs> I okay. really, oh. I really, really have. Every adult in this movie, except for like Alice's dad, who's trying is, like, so over the top that they're in a Tales from the Crypt episode. like. And, and, and is this a thing, yeah. like, I, I feel like, Patrick, we might have talked about this before. Is this a thing like what's going on in Derry, where where the adults are just, yep, yeah, you know, some dead kids, whatever, you know, I mean, I, 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 got, I got shit to do, I don't have time to worry about this. Or, or is, is, this, is this on purpose, or is this just... Bad screenwriting. Where where I don't think so. I think yeah, it's the latter. I, it's giving them a little too much credit. I think that the you know I think it's just a, you know a, you know the very typical you know eighties kind of you know teen movies where the parents are always out of touch and and you know a little emotionally neglectful and and yeah, I think know. that is much more in line with what its its real intentions are. It is following a trend line. Nightmare on Elm Street, beyond the first film, has always been reactive. And it's more reactive to pop culture than it is to what was happening in horror. But there's definitely a don't tell mom the babysitter's dead philosophy that goes throughout 
the entirety of the franchise where adults are just bad at this and I'm a teen and they don't understand me. And because they don't understand me, I'm put in peril and oh my God, a dream demon is put on top of this. But I don't think there's the the idea behind it all that's dairy level adults here are turned evil because they turn a blind eye to both bigotry and racism and death and therefore their bargain turns them into evil people no there's not that level of thought given to this it's just like a an after effect it's just like a lot of these films are brown yeah all the adults suck <laughs> i mean i i mean i'm I, I am continuously shocked anew that there are still families living in this town. With every new movie, I am amazed that people just, as soon as their kids turn 13, they don't, you know, draw up stakes and, you know, get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> it would be a smart philosophy. <clears throat> we, we are not doing well at uh, getting across the plot there's, points there's of this too, movie, but fuck it. There's too much. There's too yeah. much. One of the themes that I began to draw in the second half of this movie is there is no wrong way to mourn. But here are some real contenders. <laughs> Mark's up there with his with him turning around the death of the girl he supposedly loved into yelling at people and being a real dick. Or you have Dan's parents who are mourning in a way that says, I want to steal that unborn child from you. It's really great. Everyone's doing fantastic. <laughs> this goes back to like my problems with the tone because yeah. this decides to try and be the one Elm Street to be like, hey, let's really deal with the death of these kids because that's going to make people care about them after they're gone. You know, you have these characters who are so morose and depressed the whole movie. And then you have Freddy being his absolute like pop culture Freddy self. So that absolutely nothing he does in this movie feels like the malicious actions of an evil <laughs> dream demon, but accident act comes Go across ahead. as feeling like attempts to cheer these poor assholes up that just go too far. <laughs> he's like a, he, he's like, yeah, he's like an, a, an annoying big brother. He's, a, he's about, I, I kept expecting him, one of the characters to wake up and he's just kind of leaning over him to do that thing where like you know, older siblings are coming to the way they like they let their drool on you and then they, they like suck it back up before it like falls on you or like you know they're gonna flick it he's like flicking people in the ears and just it, yeah you're you're absolutely right it's like they're just you know they're like walking around like they're in a morrissey video and he's like yeah i got some jokes for you you want to hear yeah. some jokes yeah, yeah look at basically... me i'm on a, skate I'm on a skateboard isn't that cool no yeah all right <laughs> I'm amazed Mark's death wasn't like Freddy went to give him a noogie and it's like, oh darn, I scalped him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, rope burns where like you, you take someone's arm and you like, you squeeze it and it just absolutely rips his arm off or something. Yeah. E every death in here is a two for flinching that goes one step too far and then someone ends up dead. None of it equals anything it's not scary it's so it's not, not scary. scary exactly but it's, it's also it's not fun no yeah. it's, it's not, not fun it's, either it's exasperating that that's the the best part of the movie is when finally yvonne figures out oh okay i i guess they're not making this up even though mark literally shows up with a book full of exposition and she, <laughs> she's like fuck your exposition and she's like yeah no you guys are crazy everybody's crazy except me so um <laughs> But, like, at one point, so this is when Freddy has her in, you know, death jacuzzi. And Alice shows up, she has her in, she's like, why don't you just shut up? And it's just like, <laughs> yes, finally, someone says it. It is, it, is my, it is my favorite line in the entire movie, just telling Freddy, why don't you just shut up? Please. Yvonne uh, used to be... My, like my le as a kid, like my least favorite character in the Elm Street franchise because she's just so aggressive and abrasive. And now Yvonne is my favorite character in the movie because <laughs> as a character, not even speaking to Kelly Jo Minter, like Yvonne, more than any character I've ever seen in a slasher franchise, desperately does not want to be in this movie and tries to walk out of it at every turn. <laughs> She is caught in a maze in which cameras are on, and she inexplicably changes costume all the time. She can't <laughs> get her way out of this movie. You know what? I think you may have turned me around entirely on Kelly Jo Minter in this movie. 
I'm so glad you're here to help me process this complete I mean, there's, shit there's nothing, burger. There's nothing wrong with her performance. I just feel that the character refuses to believe what's going on you know, far longer than, than is plausible. Especially, well, again, since she, sh- she should know all this already. It, you're presuming that she has grown up in, in, you know, in the Elm Street neighborhood. She should know about this man with knives for hands. She, sh- <laughs> she should know yeah. that this was a real person. Who really killed people? Twenty and, 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 plus children, and somehow, and somehow came back to life to kill more people. I mean, and just yet she's, in the yeah. in the amount of deaths at her high school alone, this should be an awareness of this is a bad place to be. Even in Friday the Thirteenth, they're like a lot of fucking people died around <laughs> here. They they take it in in a nightmare in Elm Street. It's just mind wiped every single time, including survivors. Yes, yeah. and last time you noted that there was no real connection. Like in the last of you, you noted there's no real connection between part four and part five, other than giving Alice a completely new group of friends who are um, analogous to her old friends. Yeah. So I went back to the novelization of an oh, okay. Street Five: The Dream Child. <laughs> wow, you came prepared. You weren't oh. our most prepared guest yet. It shares space. With the novelization of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. The entire book is 188 pages, and the novelization (laughs) of part 5 begins on page 102. (laughs) You know what? I think that's the perfect amount of time. Honestly, I don't know how much more pages I would dedicate to it. Please continue. So, because part 4 ends, and then the novel of part five begins on the next page i was like they have to address it there has to be something in this book to tie these things together there has to be some more of alice mourning her brother her brother who died the year before and i quote last year after the deaths of her brother and friends alice thought nothing good would ever happen to her again but that had changed that's it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow that uh well fuck you to everyone from uh dream master <laughs> you suck that's all they get your, your lives meant nothing to her <laughs> oh man oh this is the protagonist of both movies strangely enough they fumbled this so fucking hard. Yes. I'm surprised um, they didn't drive the football into the Earth's crust. Yeah. Well, while I've, you know, read from the script, I have to acknowledge there was never a finished script. The version with the rap, which was the shooting script, was not <laughs> meant to say be the one that went before the cameras. It was just mm-hmm. the latest version that they had by the time they got to shooting. There were nine drafts of the script. Dream Master came out in August of 88. Dream Child came out in August of 89. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Oh my God. This movie was being constantly rewritten while they were shooting. It just makes you wonder if they don't know what a Nightmare on Elm Street movie is, why dedicate yourself to making sure you get out another one in one year's time when you know you can't do it well? Like it's a miracle that four comes off as well as it does and it has almost no script and no story and they're like we're gonna learn our lesson let's just do this again and roll the fucking dice yeah and the original treatment uh by john kip and uh john skip and craig specter which they pretty much shot down actually had some really good ideas like it was it felt like a movie about something and like skip and specter were major like authors at the forefront of the splatterpunk movement and a another huge splatterpunk author, Clive Barker, was the one who recommended them for the job, presumably after turning it down. Yeah, sure. Uh, he made the right choice. Their original version was more about everything stemmed from the opening scene, which was not supposed to have dance glasses or raps or any of those things in it, <laughs> which is it was supposed to be a movie about the summer after graduating high school and the fears and insecurities that stemmed from the fact of these are these friends aren't going to be your friends forever. You all are doing different things with your lives. You're all afraid of very different things now. And it would have been a nice balance against the four high school movies before it. There was also a really interesting idea for Freddy 
in the initial genesis of this movie, which was that Freddy did not actually know that he was uh, coming back through Alice's unborn baby until he was already there. Like this was kind of Freddy was his back against the wall working with what he had because he's like in the dark depths of wherever Freddy goes when they don't kill him and sees uh, like a light and he goes like towards the light and it's this this unborn child and he's like oh crap so we got a body swap movie we got a big we got a <laughs> we got a, a well, sort are, of 80s really, body swap set those are really big in 89 we, we got like the one with dudley moore and kurt cameron <laughs> yeah we got the one with fred savage and judge reinhold we got the one with george burns and that other guy who's <laughs> name i can't remember <laughs> Um, you know, that was a, that was a thing. I do wonder if that would have worked better. It certainly is a more solid concept. And well, that's the other thing is we don't know how the tones would have worked because ultimately, if you put Stephen Hopkins in charge of it, you would have had very interesting looking, uh, sets and set pieces with someone who has zero desire to interact with actors <laughs> or construct a normal tone. And also you have his complete disregard with one of the stars of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, and that is practical makeup effects. And he's kind of like, I think this stuff is kind of stupid. And it shows. Okay. It just everything is filmed with disin disinterest. So the thing with the makeup effects is that this movie was shot so quickly that all of the makeup effects were shot were shot second unit at the same time all of the first unit stuff was being filmed so that they would have two completely different things being shot every single day so i have no idea how much of the makeup stephen hopkins ever even saw and that's but that's also a problem because <laughs> it's not like it's not like dream master had a ton of time for Rennie Harlan to get up into his elbows in second unit stuff. And it doesn't look this bad. I mean, it's a step down from Dream uh, Warriors, but most things are. It, but it's not egregious. This Everything about this movie is egregious. It is poorly thought out. Every teenager strews clothes around their room like they explode off of their body, including Mark. Who, it looks like a fucking hurricane went through where he lives. And these this, this, these are the most cluttered supposed, sets I've ever seen. Where is he yes. supposed to be living? Is he living in like a, in a warehouse? warehouse? Yes, he, he lives, lives in a warehouse. In his, he lives in his dad's warehouse. And what was supposed to... How did they think that he died? I mean, because he, you know, after this whole Super Freddy thing, which is the dumbest shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Yes. You see like his, I guess it's his severed arm. <laughs> and and the, and then the then then later you know, you see like you know the body bag being brought out and the cops like you know oh that place was a disaster I'm surprised they both didn't get killed it's like what do you think happened that cop <laughs> is a piece of shit he just I mean, died and that cop is like that cop is literally suggesting that Alice should be brought in for being in that room that yeah, was for that existing bad. where so, where an accident happened like I'm gonna bring you up on being around charges. But then they, again, but they she's leaving like a, a trail of bodies wherever she goes. But so. do they think like a cabinet fell over on him or something? I mean, like, what did That's they the think impression, yeah. happened in there? What do they think happened to Glenn in part one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't know. We never find out what they think happened to Glenn. My big Because one. the coroner's too busy throwing up. <laughs> My, my biggest one in the entire franchise is how Joey's mom tries to wrap around her head how he got inside of his waterbed. He drowned inside of a clear waterbed. Like, how is that possible? Literally, like, you would, you would need, like, bones or CSI up in that bitch to figure out how the fuck that kid died inside his own sealed waterbed that happens to be clear but also has enough light where you can see what's going on inside. Also, just before we move on, fuck Wally George's neo-Nazi Orange County ass. I hope you're rotting in hell right now, you fucko. Fuck you, Wally George. I hope you rot in hell. Ah, hey, let's get back into the fun. Um, 
we're Mark... going to piss off we're going to piss off our our our, our alt right fans. <laughs> oh yeah, we got so many, so many uh Huntington Beach neo Nazis. Love Kill by Kill. Mark says something that I wanted to bring up. He says, "Quote: The Phantom Prowler would have wouldn't have been afraid to tell Greta how he felt." That's not good. That's not great. If uh, can I tell you how I would feel if the Phantom Prowler started sharing his feelings with me? <laughs> I love that. Scared, scared that this oh, also, this he... Western RoboCop is going. I I think I care for you, but I'm not going to shoot you in the dick. That's how much I care. I mean, does he really think she didn't know how he felt about her? Yeah, I mean, there's, so... there's there's literally a scene where he's like early, where he's like leaning on her and looking up at her, like like with the puppy dog eyes. My undying love, have some. <laughs> <laughs> All he does for the first half of this movie is tell her how he feels. And before we really dive into the comic book sequence, I have to note that we have the comic book sequence in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie in what is probably undoubtedly the worst era of comic book history. With ag- <laughs> the aggressively over the top, the birth of the Rob Liefeld era of comics, of gun fu, and <laughs> these aggressively overly macho stereotypes. And I love that you have the Phantom Prowler as an unironic non-satire of that (laughs) and you are suggesting that this is a man who is deeply in touch with his feelings listen he has (laughs) all six issues of marvel's visionaries <laughs> which is not a good don't let the mark badgley art suck you in to reading visionaries everyone <laughs> oh my god he also has just a copy of christian mythology hanging out in his vast library i guess he uh shops at the same occult store slash convenience mart that tommy jarvis 3.0 frequents well i mean it's like the it's clearly from the same bookshelf that he got his roman history from <laughs> But it, it's not really reflected in the Phantom Prowler mythology, all the Phantom Prowler mythology that we do get. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. God. No, I, absolutely none of his research goes into his apparently serious creative project whatsoever. <laughs> Which a man spur. roams the West He's dressed like, in in a leather a torn leather poncho like fucking Jason he, Voorhees. I was going to say he's like, he's like Jonah Hex. But needs a giant target placed in front of his eye that is not lined up with the gun. What is? How is that helping you? Like, oh, this is a target in my eye. Now these guns that are attached to my hip will never miss. That's not how guns work. It's not how aiming works. That's not how anything works, everyone. So uh, to, to, to leap back into the shooting script, there's actually... The one line I really l- wish was kept in the film at the at the dawn of the comic book sequence uh-huh. where Mark is seeing the illustrations depict the mayhem that Freddy's already caused. Mm-hmm. So Mark is literally reading the comic adaptation of the movie while it's happening like he's in space balls. And he's <laughs> watching this happen. <laughs> okay, so he sees Dan's death, he sees Yvonne's dive, and then Mark says... You shitty son of a bitch! (laughs) (laughs) This movie needed more of that. Why that line didn't make it in, I don't know. (laughs) I I really... It's it's missing it. I'll tell you that right now. I miss it. Now that I know it was proposed, I don't know why they took it out. Can anyone explain to me how Alice's shirt works? Is she the Admiral of Aeropostal? What is going on with the cantilevered angle of her single button on her tucked into her acid jeans shirt? Oh, she's got the whole acid wash ensemble. The uh, the I believe the phrase Canadian tuxedo. Yes, she's she's got the whole look going on. Every oh. costume is a dreadful patchwork of colors that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. On this horribly juxtaposed with all these gothic sets that make it look like the cast of Saved by the Bell doing a high school production of Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> you aren't wrong. Every costume is an assault to the eyes and to logic. Again, for the second time, Yvonne is depicted diving in a swimsuit 
that has something fucking dangling from it. She's on a high board, okay? You're slamming into water going 10, 15 miles per hour uh, with a zipper on your fucking swimsuit? No. You know what? I want Stephen Hopkins to go up on that fucking high <laughs> board, put that zipper right around where his balls are and jump and tell me how he likes it. Fuck you, costume designer of Dream Child. Not to the level of Wally George. <laughs> there are there are levels here. There, there's not like a line in the sand. All there's like ten percent. Fuck you to Wally George's one hundred percent. Fuck you. I come from a very different place of Stephen Hopkins. Uh, <laughs> Tell, please, well, someone should defend him because I sure as shit isn't. I saw him yell at his cast of Predator 2 on Good Morning America. Which Love. I have no so, doubt that he did. That he did. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it, listen, I, re- someone has to have footage of this because I watched it happen and it was reported on news magazines later that night. Like it was a fucking thing that actually happened. Artistically, I don't understand. How Stephen Hopkins made a Nightmare on Elm Street 5 dream child and then made Predator 2 a movie I adore (laughs) only a year later. Probably Fox had a lot longer to develop Predator 2 so that by the time they hired Hopkins onto it, they're like, lend some visual style to this. Also, you had a very good director set you up basically with the pilot of this franchise follow through only we're gonna swap it from the jungle to the city and he wasn't so super involved in i gotta shove marvel's visionaries into every frame or make everyone look like they live in castle dracul that predator 2 rises and also the acting talent in i, 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 I think that is the key that yeah. predator 2 had a cast and a story <laughs> Speaking of shoved in, though, you have yes. no idea how right you are. This entire sequence that we're getting to is only in this movie because Stephen Hopkins was a comic book fan and always wanted to make a comic book movie, but he got hired to make A Nightmare on Elm Street 5 The Dream Child instead. So he planned out and storyboarded this entire sequence, this whole <laughs> comic book thing because that was the that was the movie he wanted to make this five minute stretch. This does of not the film. look like this does not look like something that someone who loves comic books would would, would make. This no. looks like something that someone says this is comic books are stupid. We're gonna make this look as stupid as we possibly can. It's awful. Every element of it, from the gleaming the cube skateboarding, non death, to then. Sh- shredding apart a stop motion and an- listen you you gotta work to make stop motion animation look uncharming and stephen hopkins manages to do it i think i think the low point for me is when freddie taunts him by showing him someone who is clearly not greta it, it, it's not at all the the actress or they don't even try to make it look like her so with like a blonde wig on and and it's just sort of like mutant doll there was a halloween mask that I used to see in Spencer Gift as a child. (laughs) That was these two big puffy cheeks with vomit coming out the mouth and dribbling down the chin. And I thought it was the grossest thing I'd ever seen. I had nightmares about it. I am not appreciative of the fact that it got an acting gig in A Nightmare on Elm Street 5 (laughs) The Dream Child to stand in for Greta. (laughs) Yeah, also, why why would she look like that to him? He wasn't there in her dream. He didn't so, see it. So uh, he didn't see it. She would have been, as far as he knows, she choked to death. So you, why show her in a form that he didn't see her in before? How would he even know it was her? And why does, why does in his dream, her stomach appear now to be even more jello? I'm like, oh, this is very, uh, ad, you know, even below adolescent, very tween focused. And then out of nowhere, fruit gushers appear on his hair and... And there's Freddy, again, the spoon miraculously reappearing, but not replacing one of his fingers, uh, knives, just in between. Every part of this is just makes you shake your head to the point you wonder if it won't just fall off your body. <laughs> this whole scene makes me, like, I can't help but think of Creepshow. 
Yeah. And how Creepshow is an example of how to do this. Creepshow is a genius movie designed to completely have a comic book aesthetic from beginning to end, to play with the colors, the exaggerated styles and colors of comic books that you think would be candy for a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. I cannot for the life of me understand the logic behind having the comic book scene in Dream Child be the one scene completely devoid of color. Yeah, uh, it's it's so weird. It's like he's got some sort of uh, 2000 AD fetish and he's like, I'm going to show these Americans what a real comic book is. It's black and white and boring as fuck. I think Gene is right. I don't think he likes comic books. I think he likes to tell people he likes comic books, but I don't think he enjoys reading them or talking about them or making art based on them. He likes I, to, I get it now. He like, like it's something just <laughs> like snapped together in my mind because he's British. The, the 2000 AD books and Judge Dredd were so huge at the time, and he made up the Phantom fucking Prowler to be like, I'm going to have a Judge Dredd movie in my movie, without <laughs> understanding why that was remotely successful to begin with. And of the three Judge Dredd movies, if we count this in the canon, <laughs> it is by far the worst one. And I'm counting the Sylvester Stallone version Absolutely. in which a robot rips a man alive. And when in my screening, the eight-year-old who was sitting directly <laughs> behind me said, Mom, I want to leave. And the mom said, no. <laughs> oh, no. I got to yeah. see the end of this Judge Dredd movie. You don't understand, son. I have to understand what uh, Rob Schneider's going to say next. <laughs> this this is uh, this got to resolve itself. Is there anything else about Mark's death that needs to be covered? It's terrible. It's Super directed Freddy. poorly. I mean, Super, Super Freddy. Freddy is like you know, this really beefy guy. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk about this beefy guy for a second. Sure. The beefcake playing Fred Krueger. <laughs> in this sequence, is named Michael Bailey Smith. Michael Bailey Smith actually starred in one of the most notorious movies ever made. Roger Corman's 1994 Fantastic Four. Oh, wow. No. A movie that is still unreleased. Michael Bailey Smith plays a lot of makeup roles. He was was a couple demons on Buffy, I think. Uh... But he was cast, of course, to play the thing uh, oh, before understanding, because that is his his acting talent, is being right. a man in a suit. A beefy man. <laughs> before realizing that there was a clause that, uh, you know, his contract was like, he was cast to play Ben Grimm, and because he's like above the line cast now, his stunt double would actually have to play the thing. So he was hired for one thing, which was to be a rock monster before finding out contractually that he could not be a rock monster. So every time he turns into the thing in that movie, he grows, I swear to God, at least two feet shorter. <laughs> Oh, God. And that's our Super Freddy, but not only our Super Freddy, that is our beefcake naked Dan in the opening of the movie. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yes, it's not his uh, butt slash rib cage, but it is his <laughs> mound of roi- roiling uh, muscles. The, the, uh, the script accidentally makes that a lot more graphic, too. <laughs> Oh, God. that's what that needed with because, uh, shots uh, of insertion. Uh, what what did it want? The script, I could find the first line, and I know in my heart that this had to be a typo because they were moving so fast. <laughs> and I know they meant to say bicep, but <laughs> what we have is tight shot on a delicate hand caressing a muscled bishop. <laughs> Well, we don't really know Dan's religious beliefs, uh, (laughs) nor where he stands within the the Church of Rome. So who knows? Super Freddy has a line here evoking uh, Superman in the worst way possible. He says, faster than a bastard maniac. Yes. How fast? does this movie believe bastard maniacs are and why would i be impressed if you were faster than one that is the only way i can conceivably wrap my head around why the skateboarding sequence begins this scene i there's no reason for it mark has no 
no sign of owning a skateboard. All well, he, I can he carries think, one around a whole bunch, but he never really hops. On he top never of uses it. it. But all yeah. I can think is that that is there to clock the speed of a bastard maniac before you get to this <laughs> line. <laughs> Just it's a compare and contrast. Oh, see, they, I thought this was useless, and would, but what it's really doing is is giving us a an SAT problem. And you know, when they wrote these lines, they were like, "Oh shit, this is great." <laughs> Just smoking a cigarette after that scene, it's like this is peak content right here. Though, granted, nothing is as bad as uh, Dan's death, where they throw out every alt, every other Freddy line they had in the tank oh Um, god one after the other every like this is fast this is furious we're on a cannonball run shut up you don't have to record everything nitro injection fast lane (laughs) fuel injection cards (laughs) accelerators pep boys car washes Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. (laughs) You'll pay for the whole seat, but you'll only need the edge, bitch. (laughs) Yeah, that was a really good one. I felt the delay there was unnecessary. That was an excellent ad lib. I can't believe we're an hour into this. And we've you can't can't go beat by beat with this, though. No, there isn't. Alice uses the demon pram as a weapon. This is see, here's the thing. There's a part of this movie that I feel has a kernel of good idea. And that is, after a bunch of movies telling me that you can affect your dreams and fight Freddy fucking Krueger, finally, in the fifth one, we see somebody stop not just flipping around and trying to karate fight an invisible maniac. She throws iron rods into his face she stabs him with a demon pram like there's an active element to alice being able to fight back yes it's not to say that she should win every fight in the movie that's not to say there shouldn't be losses of her friends it is a slasher movie after all but i like the idea of someone who can punch back against freddy and it makes it more difficult for Freddy to kill people, but ultimately he's going to have more bodies in his in his win column than Alice will. So to me, you'd still have a horror movie, but the way it's executed here, where we're caught in a fucking M.C. Escher painting like you're locked in some freshman's dorm for the rest of your life is not my favorite i'm so glad we've arrived at this scene because the the bit of her skewering freddy is maybe like the one badass beat alice has uh in the entire film well that and shut up i'd say are are a a good one-two punch of her being proactive which is refreshing which is why this is what people like about nancy and what new line seems to dislike is the whole you can fight back that's what a fucking audience is liked about the parts of that movie. Like, why do you, why do they not get this? Especially the first movie where you had one of the most proactive heroines ever in a slasher yes. film. But this, uh, this beat of her, her taking control and skewering Freddy through the mouth of that big pool stick or whatever <laughs> is uh, Alice. Is down on her look. Alice is forced to the ground. Freddy is towering over her. This is a big moment. This is Alice gaining that inner strength by saying, I am the A, the L, the I, C, E. We're three together. And that's the way it's gonna be. And as Alice and Yvonne speak, she flails Freddy across the stomach while Yvonne executes a backflip as previously seen in her diving out of Freddy's grasp and onto dry land. Oh, Oh, I'm physically ill. (laughs) I, I thought the worst rap in this movie was Dr. Ice. And it turns out... It still is, only because uh, it was excised from uh, the actual finished product. That is so white (laughs) in all the wrong ways 
just when you think it can't get worse, it turns out it could have been worse. Yag's always there for you. <laughs> oh, man, alive. It's speaking of worse, the dream child tries to pull a gate out here <laughs> where Freddy's body is tossed to the ground, but he becomes spiders. And it's it is that is not good. That's not a good effect, everyone. No. That looks like something out of a 1920s Disney Alice in Wonderland movie. That's that's some poor execution. Yeah, because we keep talking about the effects, I want to note um, that there was a big change of hands in the effects department between two, three, and four, and five. Uh, yeah, I, I mean there are there are great people involved in the effects end of this, but I it's just a cacophony. Either it was too fast, it was too dumb. Or a combination of the two, putting it all together. Like, I just don't think they were given enough time, money, or resources to make their ideas look good. And on top of that, no one knew how to photograph them. There were also a lot of bad ideas. And most of them, clearly not all, but most of them made it to the screen. Let's talk for a second about what exactly, what contribution Amanda Kruger eventually makes to saving the day which is basically telling someone else what they have to do (laughs) which again this whole thing with this baby and this baby taking the form of a fully grown well not fully grown but but a a school-aged child i'm i'm confusing myself here how does she know that who jacob is yes (laughs) thank you yes she, she addresses him by name you know, Jacob, here's what you need to do. Well, what are you here for? You know, I mean, you know, what did, what did, what did Yvonne, so Yvonne went to all this trouble of, of sneaking into this horrifying, you, you abandoned asylum to set you free so you could show up and tell another person what they need to do, which is, which is distract him. That's her. That, that is her. That that is her contribution. You have to distract him. Unleash yeah, I, the power he has given you. When? At what point? And why did this never come up before now? Now that we have to look at him with Freddie Burns on his face, why, why? was this never a thing before why? now? Why is he? Nope. If he is, if he is ostensibly taking possession of this child, he would. The child would not be born looking like him. That's, that, that, that's not how reincarnation works. You're putting your spirit or your soul or whatever into another person's body. There's no reason why this kid would have... He wasn't born with these scars. And, and I think that's something that the movie at some point retconned. That, yeah. that he was born because he's the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. Which, no, that's not how biology works. You know? I, I don't think it, that was it, ever it takes, meant to it, like it, be like the it, canon. But I think... It takes, it takes one. It yeah. takes one. And he was not born... He, you know, now it's, he's, he was born this deformed you know, product of, of, of an unholy union. No, he was just some dude that killed a bunch of kids... And then people set fire to him, and that's why he was all scarred up. So there's, there's, I mean, I prefer way, I much prefer that version than this. No, he, like Lady Gaga, he was born this way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you no. know, this, this, this new version where he's a mutant from, from birth. And that any time, any you know, being that he will put his soul into will not just take on his desire to murder people they will look like him they will sound like him which is really fucking stupid in a nine-year-old yeah i think they're trying to go for like more that his his dream power is manifested by his scars so jacob gets them when he uses it and alice gets it when she uses it which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever no, I mean, um, unless it's implying that the, his ability, that he's always had this ability to haunt people in their dreams and it took it a, a toll on his outside body. No, that doesn't make any sense. For a franchise that never carries over one film into the other, it is weird to suddenly revive the Freddy's revenge idea that Freddy can possess another living creature. Which, at least that's set up. But then, 
uh, the coup de gras is there's yet another way to kill Freddy Krueger because apparently no one can decide how fucking Freddy Krueger works. So, so far, he's died by lack of belief, died by the power of heteronormative love, died by Catholicism right, died by mirror, and now died by pre-born child puke soul cannon and he doesn't even really die it's more like they trap him like he's a ghost in a ghostbusters movie at least i just this you know amanda krueger who is set up as this tragic character who who you know she suffered in life and she suffers in death hey guess what everybody she's still suffering you know what I mean? I mean, at least they could. I mean, it would have been corny as hell, but I mean, they could have at least had her like you know, smiling, be typically and ascending to heaven. You know, a a a a job finally well done. Nope, she she gets to have a fully grown man back in her body. <laughs> I, I mean, and locked again, in, and locked in a chamber with him. How weirdly pro life bullshit is this movie that it's like. Oh, we're going to condemn this woman to carry this evil dream demon child for eternity. Yes. It, like, like she has this coming, uh, young ghost nun, the young ghost nun who fucks. Like, I don't, I don't like this movie at all. And I'm getting angrier and angrier, uh, I'm angrier, I'm getting more and more angry about it. This Movie also explicitly states early on that there there is one way to stop all of this by having an abortion, which Alice immediately shuts down. And it's like they're patting themselves on the back by even including a discussion of abortion. But it notes that she could save the lives of herself and all of her friends if she did decide to abort this, this fetus, but she does not. Yeah, no, she doesn't even consider it. She's like, yep, yeah, no, no, I'm not nope. doing that. Yeah, she immediately <laughs> shuts like, it down. I'm sorry. Your, your you ass could, is grass and I'm the mower. You, you know, you could stop Dan's parents from tormenting her. You could stop all this horror. Nope, not not even. Nope, I gotta have a, I gotta have a piece of, I, I gotta have a part of Dan with me. Lady, keep his picture in a fucking picture frame. That's the, that's the, that's how you can ha- keep a part of him with you. That's yeah. Put it up in your room with all the other uh, cast photos and a planter made of someone's pants. How the <laughs> fuck does that work? That's the most horrifying thing in this entire movie. She has decorated her room with the lower half of a mannequin with plants growing out of the waist. The the scene you skipped over, I rewatched three times because I cannot, for the <laughs> life of me understand what dan's mom is doing from with her performance i always remembered it being garbage dan's parents coming in and being like hey we're gonna take the baby and there's nothing you can do about it but the entire scene is like she's acting it out at gunpoint and she (laughs) is terrified for her life and reading from cue cards she is stammering. She is whimpering, being like, well, the courts might, might not agree with you. <laughs> no one was nominated for an Oscar or even Golden Globe for any of these performances. This is the main problem when you dabble, and I put that in dick fingers, dabble with the concept of be, of, of choice. This is the wrong place to do it. It has no place in a Nightmare on Elm Street series. The film does not benefit from it being a part of it. It does not come off the way the writers, director, or producers intended it to. And as a result, you flood the viewers, many teenagers, with terrible ideas and misconceptions about both what having a child is like or what that choice is like. And this film should be pilloried for it. Oh, yeah, I, definitely. I think that absolutely beautifully sets up a quote that I found <laughs> from an issue of Fangoria mm-hmm. about actors and choice. This is from the beacon of positivity, the ever spokesperson of the, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And a quote from Fangoria from an interview on set, on the set of this movie in makeup, he said this. I had no choice, sighs England. 
<laughs> when I agreed to do Nightmare 4, I signed a contract guaranteeing I would do Nightmare 5. Unfortunately, it seems like we never get to start fresh. There's always this rush to get them out. We finished the last one in July. Here it is April, and I'm starting again. That's a little too close. <laughs> yeah, Robert, it really is. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, this is... I mean, yeah, he signed a contract, but also there he did not ever have any more power in the industry than he did at this moment. He was a bona fide movie star, and the flex here would have been to go instead of just getting any Nightmare on Nightmare on Elm Street movie out. Let's make a better Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And New Line's like, that's not the way we do things around here. Well. It kind of should be. <laughs> um, any last thoughts about this uh, complete clusterfuck of a motion picture uh, from anyone? Nat? If there's anything, and I know you guys talked about this, this is any last thing I'd want to point out. It's the change in Freddy's makeup design. Yeah. Which I he, think is also... got the dry look going on here. A very bad idea. I know, like, it was... The makeup design was a selling point in the marketing of this movie. Oof. Because they got back uh, the original makeup artist from the first movie, David Miller. As if, like, 2, 3, and 4 weren't the movies that skyrocketed, skyrocketed the popularity that Freddy, that Kevin Yeager makeup design of Freddy in those three films was on everything. Every piece of marketing. It was on bubblegum. And they're like, hey, no, David Miller was re- actually really upset that uh, someone else got to do freddy and so we got him back and he had the, this idea of making freddy look more like an old man so freddy who is a creature who exists in dreams has dark circles under his eyes like my man can't get enough sleep <laughs> Gina, uh, any parting words for this uh, quote unquote movie? I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it it's just, I, I know. And, and the sad part is, I, I know that yet the next one is supposed to be even worse. And, and, and again, I don't remember either. I, I didn't remember much of, of, of this movie. And I remember even less about. about Freddy's dead except that I it, it remains the only one that I actually have seen in a theater and and I don't know I, and I remember that there's a a bit there's like about 20 seconds that's in 3D for 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 no reason whatsoever and I know this is the one with all the stunt casting in it and and I'm just like I'm grimacing in in anticipation but yeah the the I did not remember how blatantly pro life this movie was it, it, it is and now that we have talked about it it's actually kind of borderline offensive at the yeah. at, at this point that I mean it is the logical solution to this whole problem <laughs> That you need to get rid of that child, and and it's not something we often bring up on this on this you know on this here you know horror comedy podcast. But I mean, it's pretty shocking that you know this is no, that's completely out of the question. I would never do such a thing, even though it is the only solution that makes sense. You know that that no, so many people to have, have died. this crazy MC Escher yeah. battle. Yeah, let's let's you know go into battle with this man that we already know that has been established multiple times cannot be killed by normal means because <laughs> I I can't let go of my high school boyfriend. I dislike this film. I, here's my philosophy going into uh, Freddy's Dead. The intention, because a lot of the people involved were, let's make this the John Waters Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And that's, I don't remember dick about it, aside from just generally not liking it. And Yafet Kodo's in there. So I'm going to go into it with the idea that the intention for it was John Waters' Nightmare on Elm Street. And hope that that improves my attitude. But I can tell you that the only way it could possibly get lower than the bar set by Dream Child is if it digs underneath it like a fucking mole man. I just don't know. I mean, do we need a campy Nightmare on Elm Street at this point? I mean, this one's pretty campy. 
This one but is, it's also pretty gothic y. Half is, the problem is the tone. Yeah, it's it's very self aware of, of what kind of movie it is. Yeah. You know, I mean I don't know that we need one that's even more self aware. You know, that that you know, that is made by people who don't actually like these kinds of movies. You know, because that's how you that's how you end up with, with, with Jason X. You you get a movie made by people who don't like these kinds of movies and don't like the people who like them. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is how they're going to have a little fun with that. <laughs> uh, so uh, on that delicious note, uh, before we go, uh, Nat, why, uh, why don't you tell people where they could find you and read your stuff and hear more from you? Yeah. So um, Bloody Disgusting, Dread Central, Diabolique, as you mentioned, I'm all over the place. I'm trying to be. Um, I have a book coming out. As you mentioned, the complete history of Puppet Master that I'm trying to be in the stages of wrapping up now. And you can find me on Twitter at Nat Bremer. Follow it. You are must follow if you enjoy horror because you uh, mine so many amazing details as witnessed here in the past, strangely enough, hour and 20 minutes that we ranted and ranted about this motion. We had a lot to say, goddammit. I, I didn't think we'd have anything to say. And yet, here we are. Um, so please follow Nat on Twitter and uh, read his stuff. It's great. Uh, Gina, where can people find you on this here internet? Well, I have my own website in which I write about movies and television at GinaRadcliffe.com. And I am also a writer at TheSpool.net. I'm currently recapping the television series on Becoming a God in Central Florida on Showtime. I've also done some stuff for uh, our theme for this month is Stephen King Month. So I wrote about Christine, uh, a much better movie than this one. Um, yeah, to say and the least. I am also on Twitter under Porcelain72. Do it today, people. Check it out. Of course, you can find us on Twitter at Kill by Kill Pod, uh, the Facebook uh, page and group for deeper dives and uh, just making fun of horror movies and Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street in general. Uh, gen- uh, in general. One day I'll get that word right. And of course, uh, at Kill by Kill Podcast on Instagram. But of course, the most important thing is Patreon because that's where people uh, give of themselves unto us so that this effort to make fun of Dream Child doesn't cost us money. Uh, they pay for it. And boy, uh, do are they getting something from it. Uh, what's happening this month on Patreon, Gina? Uh, we have two new uh, patrons, Dennis Mahoney and Lindsay Wilkins. And uh, we are going to be very shortly recording our uh, our next episode for the Patreon exclusive episode, which is another uh, you picked the episode, uh, either you picked a movie. Um, we're going to be doing Theater of Blood, which is our, I think, going to be our oldest movie that we've done done so far yes. not, but not strangely older than, very slasher-esque yes. in terms of rhythms so and not not older than us but pretty close um <laughs> if just barely like a biscuit yes oh. but uh but yeah i am i am i am gonna tuck in for that one tomorrow night i'm looking forward to it that should probably be up for our patreon listener our patreon uh members only uh, about a week from now for as we record this so yeah 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 it's uh, it's uh, patreon.com and... uh, kill, uh, slash kill by kill yes do it today people check it out and that does it for us uh, so for myself uh, Gina and for Nat the body count will continue uh, bye bye everybody bye bye Kill by Kill is produced by We Write Good and is intended for entertainment purposes only. A Nightmare on Elm Street is owned by New Line Cinema. No infringement is intended. Kill by Kill's logos were created by Josh Hollis. Visit him at joshhollis.com. The Kill by Kill theme was created exclusively for us by Revenge Body. Get the whole track and much, much more at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com today.